So Muhammad um, in his work described not only the horrors of life under ISIS rule, daily amputations and beheadings, but also the damage to Mosul's ancient buildings and the burning of rare books. He worked very hard to verify his data um, and to put the arrival of ISIS into economic and sociological context. So the result was a deeply granular local story about poverty, about neglect, about corruption, about sectarian tensions, about a security vacuum, and not simply a story about scary Iraqis. At times his reporting came close to looking a bit like poetry, where he talks about life and loss in the city. At other times, um, his reporting um, came close to exasperation. So in one interview, I think with an American journalist, an anonymous interview, he described ISIS as simply bonkers. Yeah. So Omar <coughs> lost one of his close friends um, to Islamic State. Um, he was horribly killed by them. And there's no doubt that um, if he'd remained there, or if he'd been unlucky, if he'd been discovered as the author of Mosul, he would have met a similar <coughs> grisly fate. He left Mosul in 2015 and continued writing from exile and outed himself as the author of the blog late last year. But the result was not only um, the most reliable source of information about what was going on in the city, amid a huge amount of disinformation and propaganda on all sides, but an invaluable resource for both journalists and scholars. So I think maybe, Omar, if you could just start us off by telling you what led you to write the blog in the first place and to think that you could, or perhaps about the environment at the time. Um, actually, it all began in 2003. And in 2003, I was waiting for something, which also dates back when I was in the primary school. Um, I used to ask many questions when I was a child. And um, the teacher said, stop asking questions. Once you become an adult, you may be allowed to ask a question. So I, on that day, I went to the bookstore and bought my first calendar and started counting <laughs> when, <laughs> when I will become an adult. So just one year before um, I became an adult, it was 2003, um, the Americans arrived. And in the aftermath, many uh, jihadist and extremist groups emerged and they started killing people for various reasons. But one of these reasons was for asking questions. So I started, or I thought of my teacher's words, and I realized that questions can kill. Um, another event happened in 2003. Um, after Baghdad was fallen in the hands of the um, coalition at that time, the uh, US Army and the British Army, um, Mosul fell down in the second day. It was Friday, uh, 10th of uh, April. Um, until that time, the Americans didn't arrive to Mosul. So the preacher in the mosque was praising the regime and was calling for the people to fight against the, as he called them, the crusaders. But a few minutes later, a Humvee with six American soldiers and a tribal leader was with them. They crossed by the mosque. I don't know how this preacher knew about them because he was inside the mosque. Then he started shouting, uh, this is uh, the day of freedom. So I was confused. Just a few minutes he was calling to fight against them and now he feels like it's the freedom. So everything started from that time and started I thought like I would find answers in the history. And this is how I started reading and studying history. In 2013, I became a teacher at the university after I finished my studies. And it's only one year and ISIS arrived. It was 6th of June, 2014. And since I uh, decided to study the history of Mosul, I couldn't find the answers especially in the very uh, uh, dark days of the history of Mosul. I couldn't find answers 
Many people were killed, but I couldn't know who killed them and who was responsible. So when ISIS came, and after almost 10 years of terrorism in the city, I thought that I am responsible to prevent what happened in the history of Musa in the past from happening again, and to document everything for the future, for the sake of future, when people will come in the near future, when will they ask questions, they will find answers. And I knew the price from the beginning. I knew that the price of doing this is death, because for me, ISIS wasn't something uh, surprising, because it was a 20 through process, and almost 10 years uh, until ISIS emerged. Um, so it was a high risk, but also an opportunity. Um, because writing history, not studying history, writing the history is a great opportunity. Um, so I, I, I took this risk and started documenting from the first day of the attack, which was launched in, I remember it's 3 a.m., 6th of June. But my work evolved as everything also in the city was evolved. ISIS became, uh, they claimed that they were uh, a state, but it was more about how ISIS weaponized history. This was my observing. I observed how ISIS weaponized the history to bring another narrative, their narrative to impose it on the city of Mosul. To, because you may all know that controlling the narrative allows you to control the future. And this is how everything began. Let's talk about risk. I mean, from what I understand, you were publishing on Facebook, you were publishing on Twitter, you were publishing on WordPress. Now, and Facebook as well. It and started Facebook. with Facebook, yeah. And we, at the CIJ, we did a lot of work trying to protect journalists from mm -hmm. getting caught from surveillance. And the Islamic State, at least, were considered to have very, very this amni, their security police, very, very good computer people and, and hackers. Mm -hmm. Uh, did, what kind of steps did you take to prevent being caught? Um, I was uh, following a website called Arab Cybers. Um, on this website, they give instructions on the online security. And this was the first time I used the Tor browser to protect my identity online. Um, but this was, wasn't my only concern because um, I didn't hear any incident that ISIS found out someone uh, online or they could follow him or take him down online. Um, it was most, mostly on the ground, how to protect your identity on the ground. Um, that's why I um, pretended to be, I mean, I used different characters. Um, and somehow I uh, gave them the impression that I am not an enemy. Um, another thing was, for me, it wasn't that difficult to, to be in Mosul because many of the fighters, of ISIS fighters, um, many of them were from my neighborhood. Uh, one of them was my student. One of them was my professor. The professor who taught me the, it's really funny that she taught me the Renaissance. Great irony. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is one of the, most shocking things in my life. And the student who joined ISIS, he was always telling me, um, I, I am dreaming of becoming a professor at the university teaching history. So it was more about protecting myself on the ground. They, they didn't have these abilities, and I'm going to talk later on this, how there was a huge misconception and misunderstanding of ISIS and their abilities. We know that it's easy to hack or to, uh, um, to find people online, but it wasn't only about this. It was more about how to stay alive. Mm. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that. In, in a way, I suppose you were an undercover reporter reporting mm -hmm. in just about the most difficult yeah. conditions on earth. Can you tell us a bit about the, the methods that you used? I think you're on record somewhere as saying that you were 
one of the characters you adopted was to be a very pious Muslim who sort of agreed with them. Yeah, so you were sort of chummying with them. Can you tell us anything about methods and techniques yeah. and anything you learned? This is, this is one of the benefits of studying history, that I studied also the Islamic history and I had like, I can assume that I have a good knowledge of the Islamic history. And I found out that um, many of these fighters, especially the senior leaders in ISIS, they claim that they have knowledge of Islam. So I tried to, it's not easy to talk to them, but I found that the way to talk to them or to communicate with them is to uh, open a discussion about Islam and the history of the Caliphate. So when we were talking about um, the principles of Islam, they didn't know anything. So I started like, Claiming that I am the Sheikh who know everything. So once they see, <laughs> once they see this, uh, uh, they feel like, wow, he probably one of our leaders, but we don't know. <laughs> so I start talking to them, and whenever they feel like I have this kind of knowledge, they they pay respect to me. So I use this to start talking to them as as like um, as a friend, if I would say. And it was easy for me to talk information from them. Not like sensitive information, but information I needed that who was killed, um, what kind of uh, uh, operations they did here and there. So they talk. And this was in the mosque, and because I used to go to the mosque. But this didn't last long uh, because Many of them were killed and others came to the city. The most knowledgeable uh, fighters in ISIS were the Europeans. They knew lots of things about Islam and it was difficult, impossible for me to debate with them. So I had to change this character and I needed to t get more information, especially about the executions and the um, results of the airstrikes. So I pretended to be a doctor because I had a friend of mine who was a doctor. Uh, and I went, I used to go to the hospital asking him to wear his uh, uniform. Sometimes he'd take like a nap, so I take the opportunity to uh, wander the uh, hospital to get the numbers. I, I never prescribed anything to any patient, I promise. Yeah. Uh, Sometimes I became a taxi driver because uh, I also needed information from the people, not only from ISIS. As I said, I am writing the history, not only writing like uh, intelligence information. Because I needed to know the impression of the people. How do they feel? What do they think about what's happening? Um, I also worked as a grocer, uh, as a baker as well. Um, I needed to do this. It wasn't easy, to be honest. Uh, because to, I mean, at a certain point, I almost lost my real identity. So I tried from time to time to stop doing this. But whenever I feel like this is a huge responsibility, I say to myself, like, OK, let's take the risk and take the consequences, I have to continue this. Someone have to do this. Yeah. In a way, you were operating extraordinarily riskily, almost like a spy in enemy, enemy territory. I think you said in one interview that you couldn't even tell your mother, and then when you did tell her, she yeah. cried. Uh, my, my, my mother didn't know until I revealed my identity. Uh, the, the report was published in December, uh, December 2017. Not only my mother, my family didn't know. But to be honest, my mother always suspected me. She, uh, many times she told me, you are hiding something. I told her like, don't worry, I am fine. I didn't tell my family uh, because uh, I wanted to protect them. If I would tell them, they would misbehave easily and it will lead to expose my identity. I didn't want to lose this and I didn't want to lose my family. But it wasn't easy, it was difficult. Living, uh, one of the things I did, I used Musalai to write letters to my mother. 
I mean, my mother was sitting in front of me, but I couldn't talk to her. I couldn't tell her what I feel. So I write a letter to her on my page on Musalai. So she could read it. Yeah. She was reading Musalai? Yeah, of course. She's wow. a, yeah, she's a fan of Musalai. <laughs> A fan, no? um, <laughs> what steps could you take, if any, to ensure that you were giving beyond, I suppose, you know, what you immediately saw, an accurate portrayal of life on the ground? I mean, you were, you were, you were occupying different identities. Is yeah. there anything you could do beyond that? Obviously, not too much given the conditions, but anything you could, you could do to check facts, verify, anything like that? Um, yeah. Um, what I did is through my stay, during my stay in Mosul, and as I tried to categorize the resources I have. Uh, also, I tried to categorize the ISIS fighters whom I had contact with them. And then somehow I created the network, uh, different layers of contacts. When it comes to the Yazidi women, I have uh, two or three ISIS fighters who might have uh, information about the Yazid women, and this is how I identified um, a location where ISIS captivated Yazidi women. When it comes to the uh, acts of ISIS inside the city, executions, um, arresting, uh, prisons, etc., I also have a different contact. Some of my friends had their relatives with ISIS. And this make it easier, made it easier for me because I can easily talk to my friend who is not ISIS, but he has relatives. So I became like, and he even noticed this, uh, that I always like talk to him, I invite him. Uh, he said, why you are inviting me too much? I mean, <laughs> he didn't know. So I would go with him, and this way I found out where uh, the, the storage where they uh, uh, kept the um, artifacts from the uh, ancient sites before they destroy it. And I mean, this way I categorize the uh, contacts I have. At one point, I, like, I still have the map of this uh, network. With this way, the information was flooding to me. It's, I, I was getting lots of information. But sometimes, ISIS was, on purpose, giving information, even accurate information, to the public so they can find out or they can track down the uh, people who are working against them. And they managed to arrest one person who then led to, to the kill of 25 persons. It was a network connected to the government. and. Um, they executed them. I don't know if you have ever seen something ISIS used. They um, hanged someone and they drowned someone. One uh, of them was, um, it's, it's difficult to descri describe oh, this. Spectacular yeah, story. yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's really difficult oh. to, to even to remember this. But, but can you explain just exactly how they used that accurate information to get hold of the network? Yeah, they, they would tell someone from them, and he would talk to someone else. And because those people probably they didn't have the experience to deal with the information, and they were thirsty to information, they wanted information. So they would take whatever they want, whatever they get. And this way, this, this is also why I said in the beginning, it's more about protecting yourself on the ground and how to develop your skills according to what ISIS is doing, because ISIS was also developing its skills. Um, so this way, I mean, when I saw this, I uh, uh, said to myself, this is another proof that uh, I should uh, double check the information, because something also happened to me. One of the ISIS fighters whom I had contact with him he mentioned something to me, and it was really a very important information. It was the uh, uh, killing of three uh, uh, high-ranks ISIS leaders, and everyone was waiting for the for their death. 
and I put it directly online. Then I thought, like, what did I do? This is this is going to be the end. Then I directly deleted this, and I invited him the next day to because I couldn't sleep to see did he notice anything. He didn't. He was uh, um, killed in middle of 2015. Uh, before ISIS, he was a taxi driver, and then he, I don't know how he became an ISIS fighter, but he had lots of good information, and I got really sensitive information through him. So it's more about, again, it's more about how to develop yourself, and I developed, I would, I would assume that I developed my skills. I am, um, I wasn't a journalist, um, and to be honest, I am not a journalist. I am, uh, I, I claim to be a historian, um, but I developed this kind of investigative skills to verify the information through ISIS. And at the end of 2015, Mosul I became a platform, a huge platform for both the people of Mosul and the rest of the world. So I would also get information from the people uh, from inside the city because Mosul I became a trusted source for them. So I verify the information that I get from ISIS or the information I, I get myself and from the people. It's like a huge process. It takes time and efforts as well. Yeah. What did you, when you were sitting there in Mosul and, you know, reading the media, what did you make of reporting about Mosul from outside Mosul on the mainstream media? Do you think it was accurate or it fell victim to propaganda? It was unrealistic. Well, what, one of the disappointing things happened to me in Mosul is that I was observing ISIS and monitoring them, see what's happening and what they are doing in the city and how weak they are. And I see or read a report from certain uh, journal, international journal. I see, like, well, probably they know better than I do. Uh, ISIS is, is undefeated. And I would give up. There was a huge misunderstanding and misconception. And somehow the international media uh, gave ISIS a platform that ISIS really didn't have in the beginning. They made ISIS as like an, an undefeated uh, organization. They gave it like roots that it didn't have. And the most like problematic thing about ISIS and inter in international media is the explanation of ISIS was for this kind of medias. It was for them limited to 2014, as if ISIS emerged in 2014, which is not true. ISIS wasn't, I mean, I always say that ISIS was, or 2014 was a logical result to more than 10, even before, be, before uh, 2003. Um, this gave ISIS a space to approach the people of the city, to give them or to tell them that uh, we are your only option. And then the situation or the life in Mosul or ISIS it, itself, it became more the sectarianism in, in Iraq, like became more uh, dangerous in the country because the rest of Iraq considered uh, the people of Mosul as supporters of ISIS or they welcomed ISIS. So ISIS was using this. Simply, ISIS was telling the people, um, and their preachers in the mosque, they were telling them, look, where can you go? You can't go to Baghdad. You can't go to Kurdistan. Where, where would you go? We are your only option. For many people, they didn't find any other options, especially the tribes. They found like, Everyone is saying that Mosul is uh, is ISIS. Mosul, for them, like Mosul was an alternative to ISIS. Um, so, with the international media, the local media as well, with this kind of propaganda of ISIS, they were using 4K 
propaganda they had a sophisticated propaganda propaganda machine with all of this uh, ISIS controlled the city controlled everything in the city and many young people also as I said the tribes uh, they joined ISIS I wouldn't say that all of the members of ISIS joined ISIS for religious reasons but one of the reasons was this and in, in a tweet earlier this year, you, um, you lamented the fact that the New York Times journalist, Rukmini Kalamachi, had yeah. r removed thousands of um, Islamic State's own documents um, from the city for a series that she did in the New York Times called The Caliphate. This would be of interest to you because you're, you're, you're an archivist as well mm -hmm. as a historian. And I wonder why you were so annoyed and what you think should be done with those documents that are now in America. Well, to start about this, talking about this, I mean, we were always trying to forget Orientalism of Edward Said. I believe that everyone knows this book. We were always trying to ignore this book. But they always remind us to go back to Edward Said. We don't want to read this book, but they always say, like, go back and read this book. And this is what the New York Times did. They removed more than 16,000 documents, which simply documents the three years of Musa living under ISIS. They had argument that if we uh, didn't remove these uh, documents or if we didn't preserve them, they would have been destroyed by the Iraqis. Then, I mean, I would say, like, who destroyed the library of Musa? We didn't destroy it. We, we preserved the books from inside the library after it was airstriked. Uh, who destroyed the uh, library of uh, the Sunni endowment? Uh, it's called Al-Waqf Sunni. Or it's, it's a library that had um, ancient manuscripts. We didn't destroy it. We preserved it. Um, this argument, I mean, I would also mention what happened to the Iraqi Museum in 2003. We don't destroy our history. We are trying to preserve it. but. They are using or they are saying that we are the only people who can write the narrative of ISIS. And I actually didn't even like the, the title. Why would she write the history of the caliphate? I mean, of course she has the right to study the caliphate. She has the right to, to use any document. But what she said, well, after the debate, after all these arguments, we will be donating back the originals to the Iraqis. Come on, donating? <laughs> I mean, she would have used a better word. I mean. uh, my mission wasn't limited to telling the news. Uh, journalism would uh, investigate or tell the news. Um, I used the English language to uh, uh, publish Mosul Eye because I wanted to get the international attention, so I would use this to, uh, uh, in my fight against ISIS, so, because ISIS had, ISIS was writing in five languages. Uh, so using the international, um, or, or writing in English would give me international platform, and I will use this against ISIS. At the same time, I wanted to get the attention of the world in order to support the people of Mosul, that you are not alone. Even if we were like in the middle uh, uh, between ISIS and the people who were accusing us of supporting ISIS, I mean, referring to the other Iraqis, I, the people of Mosul needed something to give them the strength to continue their life. Um, at the same time, I was trying to de-weaponize the history of Mosul and trying to protect the narrative of Mosul and to stop ISIS from telling the history of Mosul. Because if this didn't happen, believe me, uh, even f in my opinion, even if ISIS will be defeated on the ground, even if we'll, they will be vanished, but the history will always be there and it will always be ISIS's narrative. That's why I don't, I mean, with all due the respect, with all my respect to the journalism, and journalist, um, I feel like history is more 
sensitive and more dangerous than journalism. Well, we have to study what happened in 1926, the Mosul question and the Mosul dispute, and how this led to uh, all of these problems. Mosul was forced to follow a different culture and uh, was forced to live a different life, not its life. It's, I mean, uh, the, uh, as a historian and as, as someone who studies the history, and I mean, I also have my own opinion, I feel what went wrong, it was 1926. It's the decision to, uh, to make Mosul part of Iraq. Yeah, everything happened at that time. Two thousand three, uh, the Iraqi social structure was damaged, and from that time, people decided to not be Iraqis anymore. They prefer to use their. Uh, micro identities, and this created more problems. And this was also fed uh, by by uh, the um, coalition, who supported the idea of uh, creating a government uh, based on sectarianism. Uh, they lost the trust, etc. And from that time, Iraq was going. That's why I also say 2014 was a logical result. Iraq was moving toward this result. Everything was uh, getting divided. Uh, the death in Iraq, the blood in every day. Uh, I'm not sure if we have a state in Iraq now. Even the governments that we had, I'm not sure even if it was government. Uh, <coughs> what we have in Iraq is now, and it, it began with 2003, what we have now is clans or groups. This is how Iraq, like, this, this was the process of Iraq, dividing more and more and more and more to get more people to fight against each other. Of course, it's not only the fault of the international community or it's not only the fault of or the consequences of 2003 because things were already there. Saddam or his regime, uh, they were also preparing for 2003 to come. So all these years prepared Iraq to, to receive ISIS and the consequences of, of ISIS if, even, is, is even much bigger than ISIS itself. What's happening in Iraq now is it has moved to the south, southern Iraq. Now we have tribes who have tanks. When they fight, they use heavy weapons. And the government is unable to, 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 to take the weapons from them because they have their own law. What's happening now is the millions that were spent on wasted on the Iraqi army uh, didn't do anything. Now we have more than 100 militia, Sunni militias or Shia militias or Kurdish or even Yazidi militias. We have Christian militias. We have uh, Shia militias fighting with the Christian militias. It's no more about Shia Sunni uh, uh, fights. It's more about um, a country is completely dominated by Iran uh, with its people fighting against each other. But with all that, we are trying to preserve what's left. We are trying to build a new future for the country, uh, for Mosul and the other Iraqi cities. That's why my, my, my mission now is focused on building a civil society. I'm encouraging more uh, uh, civil activities in the city, using the books, using music. We did, we did something during the battle. It was a, a concert uh, on one of the historical sites destroyed by ISIS. Uh, to, ISIS was just like 10 minutes far from the site, 
because this site is was it's the only uh, site that all the three religions uh, share it's uh, the prophet juna which was destroyed by isis it's a jewish a christian and a muslim site so we wanted to send a message to the people and to the world that we can go back to our once um, a coexistence, a unique coexistence. Um, we know that we lost it, but we are trying to work on it. ISIS used the uh, uh, foreigners in general, not only the Europeans. ISIS used them in a different way. ISIS used them as a propaganda to bring more people from uh, the other countries. Um, ISIS always suspected the Europeans and they were uh, publishing within their uh, close circle. They were publishing leaflets that be careful he might be a spy, referring to the Europeans, to the foreigners. Because they also found out that uh, some of the Russians or Chechens, uh, they were executed in Mosul, 13, one of them I think, they were spies for the Russian government. So ISIS used, used the, the foreigners in different uh, ways, but referring to their uh, knowledge of Islam, it's of course not all of them, uh, because I, I saw that one of the, two of them were from the Beatles. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure Beatles is not in Islam, so <laughs> yeah. Definitely it was necessary. Uh, having this uh, uh, academic background helped me also to protect myself. If, if I wasn't um, a teacher at the university, I wouldn't understand the difference between uh, the importance of the informa information and uh, the necessity of protecting myself to continue my mission. Because as I said, when I decided to do this, I didn't like decide this all of a sudden. I mean, I had already been in the process, and when this came, I found it as an opportunity and uh, decided to do this. So, knowledge is necessary in all of this. In in journalism, knowledge knowledge in, is is necessary to everyone. And uh, during the Battle of Mosul, because of the lack of the knowledge within the troops, uh, either the Iraqis or the other troops, uh, they couldn't understand what they were doing. Probably they didn't understand the historical value of the city, that's why they destroyed it. But if they had the knowledge of history, the knowledge of uh, uh, societies, they wouldn't do this, they would consider more options. And it takes only knowledge to defeat terrorism and the other kind of problems we have. Yeah. I, I don't think any of us would like to be left behind in Islamic State territory, but I think what Omar's great work shows us is that you know great acts of journalism emerge out of opportunity, out of ability, and out of a bit like a kind of need to document contemporary history out of a need to write things down because no one else will. Omar Mahalat, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.